Thank you very much for uh, joining the second session. The previous session uh, covered the geopolitical and security agenda in the Nordic region and Asian region. And this session moved the focus to two rising issues, IT innovation and renewable energies, which leave tremendous effect, impact on the policies, global governance, and our everyday life. About a year ago, we did not expect such a lot of work would be done without face-to-face -face contact. And, and nowadays, the webinar, like this one, where distance learning have become an, a new normal. So, and in the midst of, of COVID originated economic recession, some IT companies are showing phenomenal growth. And, and I interpret uh, the, this, the situation in this way, the legacy of the past was loosened and made the threshold entry barrier for uh, for the new paradigm, well, and, and those entry barriers got, got lowered. And green transition is also related with, with this, this trend. And the introduction of the electric vehicle is being expedited, and the carbon regulation is getting tougher, and a number of countries have joined in, in, the, in the carbon neutrality, net zero pledge. How will this trend unfold in the future? Well, that will be the, the, the big question uh, we will ask in this session. And I, I'm privileged to host uh, four panelists in this session. Anders Hector, uh, Science and, and Innovation Counselor at the Embassy of, of Sweden in Seoul is here. Klaus Skitt, uh, CEO of Nordic Energy Research has joined from the Nordic side. And from Korea, I'm happy to introduce Dean Wonjun Kim of KAIST Graduate School of Innovation and Technology, and uh, Professor Eun Jung Lim from Gongju National University. So once again, many thanks for your warm participation. Okay. Uh, so without further ado, we will start from the discussion on the IT innovation, okay? And I will first invite Mr. Anders Hector. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. I'm, um, I thought I would uh, tell three stories. Uh, I know that may be a challenge to do in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try. Uh, Next slide, please. So we used to have a serious problem with air quality in Nordics and uh, Europe. Acid rain from burning of coal and oil to generate energy and heat in Europe and in Sweden fell over Sweden. This was in the 1960s and 70s. This was killing the lakes and the forests and the pH level was getting more and more acidic in the southern parts of Sweden and much of the Baltic Sea. The problem was discovered in the late 1960s by a Swedish researcher. And we started dealing with it pretty immediately. Next slide, please. We worked on the problem through much of the 1970s. Action was taken to highlight the issue internationally, as much of the problem was coming from other countries than ours. Political restrictions were put in place for cleaning the exhaust from fuel burning facilities. And we started to recover the acidified lakes by dropping lime on them to raise the pH level. This is an experience that many countries were sharing at this time but it was first uh, observed in this uh, region of the world. Through a combination of scientific discovery, political action, multilateral negotiations and technological development, the situation improved. Today, the lakes and the forests are healthy in this part of the world, and we don't have an air quality problem any longer. 
Next slide, please. That was the first story. Story number two. This is the telephone tower of Stockholm in 1887, or rather the tower was beginning to be built in 1887. I assume they were finished quite soon. At the time, Stockholm had 5,500 telephones and was the most telephone dense city in the world. This was the era of the beginning of uh, the company Ericsson, the telecom company that we're very aware of today. Ericsson worked together with the, the Swedish government that made telephony a monopoly. It started as uh, several private entities, but it wasn't working uh, really well uh, and it was made a monopoly. Through the 1900s, Ericsson grew strong as a vendor to the government. But Sweden is a small, small country. Well, it's a large country actually geographically, but it's a small uh, market with 10, today 10 million people. But Ericsson had good products and they offered it on markets all over the world. And meeting the best in competition, Ericsson could improve their own quality and their performance. Next slide, please. Today, Ericsson has grown to be one of a few leading telecom providers. They attribute this to the open markets, to open trade and level competition. Recent political decisions have upended the open competition on the global telecom markets. For good reasons, according to some, and with negative effects according to others. Next slide, please. Uh, Börje Ekholm is the CEO of Ericsson. He has taken a stance and lobbied against the ban of Huawei products. A representative of a major owner of Ericsson and the deputy chair of Ericsson's board of directors, Mr. Jakob Ballenberg, have said that stopping Huawei is definitely not good. They see several reasons for why a ban on a competitor is bad. One of them is about the geotechnical interdependence in value chains and patterns and standards that make it impossible to surgically remove one major actor. Another reason is about the value of open competition as such. If you are protected from meeting strong competitors, you risk getting weaker and lose competitiveness yourself in the long run. Ericsson is by all means not the only Swedish company that has this mindset. Next slide, please. There are several other Swedish brands that have grown to become global names from the virtue of open innovation and open competition. And you may recognize several of them on this slide, but we can move to the next slide. That was the second story. Here is the third and the last story. And this is about the Paris Agreement in 2015. International agreements were made at that time by governments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050. Among the many effects this have, companies will need to reduce their emissions to zero. And that means all of them, all companies need to take responsibility for their own change. How do you transition your business to be fossil free and stay competitive? A platform was started in Sweden, it's called Fossil Free Sweden, where companies gathered and formulated roadmaps for how to achieve this. Next slide. And on the next slide, you can see 22 roadmaps that cover 70% of territorial emissions in Sweden. Let's just have a close look at the top row. I know the, the print is small, but I can read them for you from left to right. You have concrete with a goal to half the climate impact from house concrete by 2023. And you have aviation with the goal to have fossil free domestic aviation by 2030. And the industry cement with the goal to have climate neutral cement by 2030. Agriculture 
want to be fossil free by 2030. Mining and mineral are going to have fossil free mining by 2035. Famously, steel will have, the steel industry in Sweden will have fossil free steel production by 2045. And you have even uh, startup companies uh, entering the market because it's such an interesting venture. And finally, gas. Uh, where you, by 2045, uh, this industry want to have fossil free energy gases. 500 companies participated in this work to formulate uh, these roadmaps in Sweden. They did it to formulate their needs for what it would take to establish fossil free competitiveness. They expressed to the government and to municipalities what they need to do to enable their transition. They, many of these companies are now moving up their deadlines and strengthening their efforts to become fossil free before their global competitors and to be able to offer premium products and services that are fossil free when the customers are beginning to ask for it and some already do. Here in Korea, in Seoul, where I am, some of these companies have started a green transition alliance together with Team Sweden to bring their ambitions they formulated in Sweden for environmental responsibility to the other markets where they are active. Next slide, please. So I told you three stories. Uh, the first one was about solving the problem with acidic rain in Europe. The second was about growing international business. And the third about taking on a challenge to make your business green. Common for all three of these stories is that open innovation and international cooperation is the basis for their success. You can go to the next slide, which I think is the last. I want to mention three factors that made them successful. Engaging your counterparts or competitors in negotiations and talks is the first. The second is making use of science and technology in open innovation processes where you are compared with state of the art. And the third is partnering in public private cooperation and respecting each other's legitimate concerns. I think we do this pretty well in the Nordic countries and in, particularly in Sweden, to my mind. Uh, some places around the world are struggling more with impulses to protect dying technologies and to protect jobs. Maybe not to welcome competitors to their markets for fear of their technology being better or actually even corrupting relationships for short-term outcomes. When the three positive factors are made with good intentions, I believe this is an approach that is successful for many of the challenges we're facing, not only for innovation and green transition, but for others as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hector. Uh, I, I will do it this way in, in this session. I will uh, ask the presenter, four presenter to finish their presentation. And, and then I will open the discussion floor because to some degree, to some degree, uh, the, the four presentation topics are in a sense overlapping each other. So I think, well, that, that could create some, some synergies in, uh, in drawing the collective wisdom. So uh, next, I will invite the Dean uh, Wan Jun Kim from KAIST. Okay. Thanks, Professor Lee. Uh, interesting, uh, this interesting uh, conference and forum. Uh, yeah, today uh, I'd like to introduce some of uh, how the Korean government has been uh, preparing for the uh, after pandemic uh, energy area the policy. And uh, the, uh, my presentation is based on our like uh, almost one year uh, discussion with the uh, Minister of Energy and Industry, uh, how we can prepare for the uh, for after pandemic uh, in a more riskier uh, kind of energy market and also the global market. So let me go with uh, some of my slides. I believe I can share this. Oops. 
Okay. Um, the title of the of my short presentation is about resilient growth and energy policy in Korea. Uh, the resilient growth, uh, we actually, and first Lee also joined our uh, kind of collaborative work with the ministry that uh, we've been uh, kind of discussing how we can prepare for the uh, for the coming risk, uh, even if after pandemic, and how we can also prepare the energy and energy industry to restructure to be more resilient uh, to the coming uh, challenges. So uh, let me first uh, introduce some of the challenges that we are facing. So we are we are entering into the hyper uncertain society with many of the challenges coming in, like pandemic uh, globalization is uh, 2.0 is like uh, more restructuring of the global value chain and global warming and climate change and fourth industry revolutions and population decreases, especially in Korea. And they're coming uh, like all together kind of almost at the same time. So we are having very uh, significant restructuring and facing a lot of challenges, especially in the energy market. And the energy actually, the energy sector, uh, these risks are quite comprised of uh, four big uh, component. Uh, first is socioeconomic risk, and second, climate change risk, and third, the risk of energy policy change, and the fourth, risk of energy industry change. So based on these four dimensions, uh, we've been kind of discussing what are the more detailed uh, impact and the risk uh, in coming uh, decades. The first one, uh, there are several others, but uh, I tried to make it very short. So digitalization of economies. So many of the digitalizations makes the economy to be more vulnerable uh, for this, uh, especially in the, in the dimension of energy. And electrif uh, electrification of inner uh, industry, commerce, and home sectors is also quite giving uh, a risk for the uh, socio socioeconomic perspective. And aging and low birth rate and one person household is also kind of changing the energy consumptions and, and many, many of other uh, dimensions. So for example, like uh, interestingly, we have a blackout uh, in CES in 2018. So most uh, kind of high tech uh, and, and le uh, electricity related uh, kind of uh, international like global event has been blocked out. Uh, blackout is quite uh, contradictory. And uh, global warming perspective uh, and climate change, oh, sorry, global warming and climate change perspective Many of these uh, natural disasters and pandemic is kind of increasing in many different ways. And that's why we have our ESG issues uh, in, in global uh, society. So this global warming and climate change, even kind of shutting down the nuclear power plant, uh, very base uh, power plant, uh, uh, like electricity supply, supply stack, uh, kind of uh, system. And also uh, the pandemic is increasing in many countries. Uh, so energy becomes more of a uh, kind of uh, social safety net. So the, the importance of energy became uh, coming high, uh, become higher and higher in many ways. And also the dependency among the energy and social infrastructure uh, has been heightened. So this also makes the energy sectors to be very uh, kind of resilient to the risk. Uh, and also the, the new changes of uh, this course on climate related financial disclosure uh, is related to uh, ESG and uh, giving a high pressure on many of the companies uh, in, in their own business. So they are kind of facing a, a kind of big challenges uh, in this perspective. So this climate change uh, and uh, global warming issues are also giving uh, huge challenges for the energy sectors. And uh, so energy policy change, sorry for the Again, but uh, this energy policy change also kind of giving some high risk uh, in the energy uh, sectors too. For example, like uh, with more ener renewable energy, uh, we have very low consumption in the during the daytime, but suddenly in the nighttime we have to have a very huge increase in the in the energy uh, energy consumption. So there's a it's called like top curve, and it makes a huge risk on the uh, power plants of uh, energy. So, uh, and, and also like this uh, LEDS, uh, NDC, the National Determined Contributions, and also the participation of IT companies in the innovation uh, in the energy, uh, energy sectors. And this makes innovation asymmetries between uh, private and public sectors. And restructuring of energy industries are also giving a huge uh, impact on the private sectors too. 
So the change of the policy also become uh, became uh, in quite high risk uh, in this uh, energy uh, energy area. And the last one is about uh, many of the new uh, technology also giving a huge risk uh, in the energy sector with uh, very fast accelerating technology like uh, virtual power plant or carbon dioxide removal technologies and blockchains uh, really with the P2P transaction of the energy. So these uh, very accelerating uh, technology also kind of uh, having uh, giving a risk of uh, energy sectors with a huge change in their uh, infrastructure and the transactions and in many dimensions. Uh, especially the blockchain uh, in supply and uh, consumption uh, sec uh, sectors, and integrated real-time management is coming in with a very high impact on the energy uh, platforms. So uh, we defined uh, altogether uh, uh, as a, like a black tide with uh, a lot of risk, uh, complex uh, and continuous and gigantic increase of this risk uh, as, a, as we are kind of facing this black tide of uh, risk. And uh, so with, uh, the, with the ministry and then um, our energy experts uh, get together and uh, try to provide some of the, the new uh, policy concept, uh, how we can prepare for the next paradigm. So we define as a resilient growth. So this uh, risk and actually the risk and also the impact on the system actually give uh, the system to have uh, restructured, uh, rather it give a opportunity to uh, change the legacy systems and makes it uh, leapfrog to the, the next stage, much better systems that can actually uh, kind of accept uh, the new technology in the system itself. So we call it as a re resilient growth. The existing, uh, existing resilience is about passive recovery. They are aiming for just recovering to the existing uh, standard and the, the stage phase. But the resilient growth is actively utilizing uh, the risk and the impact and changing the systems and leapfrogging to the next phase is the concept of risk uh, resilient growth. And this resilient growth concept, concept has a three component of capabilities. The first one is preparation capability, second is response capability, and third is leap uh, capability. The most important part is leap capability, how you restructured existing legacy systems uh, by accepting the new, uh, new, tech, new innovations. So in the, in the first preparation capability, uh, we've been kind of discussing about introducing the ordinary risk monitoring and evaluation system, uh, and also preparing this national board of uh, ORME, uh, ORME uh, because I, uh, as I mentioned about black tide, the uh, risks are getting and higher and higher. And also increase of local acceptance of renewable energy, especially in Korea, the renewable energy uh, has a huge challenge. It has been especially by the local acceptance. Uh, we have some of uh, like uh, largely the acceptance of local people is the most uh, uh, like most challenging uh, part for the renewable energy uh, acceptance in Korea. So we try to focus on this uh, local acceptance uh, for re re uh, renewable energy. And the uh, response capability perspective, uh, strengthening decision-making platforms with uh, integrated energy big data system for, for the uh, central government to very closely monitor and also utilize its information to have very wise decision-making uh, on time. And also expanding uh, distributed energy resources are very important uh, directions of, uh, of, uh, of many of these uh, policies. So we also try to uh, kind of discuss introducing these energy cloud systems to kind of distribute the energy uh, to uh, like in a different uh, dimensions and different uh, local uh, regional area. Um, we expect that uh, Many of the renewable energy became very viable and very uh, kind of competent around 2030 to 2040 in between. So uh, we are able to provide this uh, distributed energy system by then. So we try to kind of prepare these uh, distributed energy systems to have more uh, kind of uh, fast response to these kind of disasters or impact of the risk uh, coming in in the in coming decades. And here, especially, the, we focus on the 3D and E, like 
decentralizations and electrifications and digitalizations and decarbonizations. So 3 d and &E is a kind of a, a very uh, like well conceptualized directions of this uh, distributed energy resources of, of, of uh, the Korean perspective. And also the restructuring the energy industry for the risk management. I'll just uh, go fast. And uh, also, uh, especially in this time, we are very centralized energy supply and demand uh, consumption uh, uh, structure and systems. Uh, we try to introduce this uh, energy cloud and make it more decentralized and localized, uh, decent, uh, uh, restructured energy uh, industry uh, for uh, kind of against this risk. Uh, risk uh, kind of coming in. And the last one is about lead capability, how we can kind of utilize this uh, risk and the impact and changing the structure and the systems to go to the next stage uh, in our energy structure. So uh, we try to focus more investment, investment on dispute energy resources and also energy storage systems. Uh, ESS, ESS uh, we kind of think that very important part of this uh, dispute energy systems sources. And also we try to foster our energy industry and transform it into more technology exporting high tech industry, not as an infrastructure for the energy supplies, but rather uh, like the semiconductor or the car automobiles uh, and the steel uh, like other uh, like Samsung and Hyundai and LG. Like we try to foster energy industry and energy sector as an energy technology exporting industries to try to introduce hydrogen energy uh, technology, uh, especially very competitive uh, level and globally. And IT integrated distributed energy system, we try to provide uh, in a global level and also large scale ESS uh, innovation. So we try to invest more on this high tech of energy sectors, especially related to energy, uh, renewable energy, that actually we, we expect to create uh, kind of transforming our whole industry as well as we lift off to the next phase of globally, next phase to the, the energy uh, energy dimensions uh, in a national level and global level. That's uh, kind of uh, our direction. So uh, this resilient, uh, the black tide risk actually create a lot of good opportunity for the nations and for the Korea to restructure energy systems uh, and whether to have more higher growth uh, in coming uh, coming decades. And thank you, Ma thank you for, for listening. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dan Kim. Okay, yep. so we we have a well, you have actually uh, the link that the IT revolution with the, uh, the the resilience, the energy innovation, and in the new system. Okay, uh, so uh, let's move to a bit more to the greener side. Uh, let's move to uh, renewable energy and climate, climate change issues. The European Green Deal, Korean Green Deal, Net Zero, and, and a series of renewable energy projects are bringing new opportunities and tasks for, for both region. So shall we start from Mr. Klaus Skett? Yes. Thank you very much. I'll just see if I can share my screen. I hope you can see it. So I will talk a little bit about renewable energy in the Nordics. And then I have been asked to, to come with a couple of, of uh, suggestions of how to, to further cooperate between the Nordic and, and South Korea. So that, that's what I will do. No, oh, okay. So, so, so why is it actually important? Or why, why do you want to have a Korean uh, Nordic cooperation? If you look at the Nordic countries, they are rather small, uh, each of them. But together, as a Nordic region, we are the 11th largest economy in the world. So we are at the same size as Korea, uh, more or less. And when you look at, at, at the Nordic countries and you, when you look at, at South Korea, you also see that, that both regions have very ambitious energy and climate targets. And then it should also be noted that there's it's already existing very strong uh, Korean Nordic energy cooperation. For example, this uh, Korean Denmark Green Growth Alliance that has been going on for, for a couple of years and many years right now, actually. So all the fundament for good cooperation is there already. So what I will do today, I will just say a few words about uh, the organization where I come from. Then I will say a little bit about uh, renewable energy in the Nordics, 
and how that could actually link up to further cooperation uh, between the Nordics and South Korea. So Nordic Energy Research, where I come from, is an institute under the auspice of the Nordic Council of Ministers. It's an intergovernmental body between Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. And what we do is that we finance uh, research and development projects uh, mostly within sustainable uh, energy. And we also uh, facilitate the intergovernmental uh, energy cooperation in the Nordic countries. So this is mostly what, what we do. And I'm the CEO of, of this institute. So when you look at the Nordics, we are part of, of the EU now. Uh, Professor Lee just mentioned the, the, the Green Deal, but there's also some of the targets that have been going on for many years. For example, this uh, policy around renewable energy and, and, and climate. We have, for example, the 2020 targets in EU, uh, where you wanted to have a 20% decrease in greenhouse gases, renewable energy, of 20% of the total energy consumption, and 20% energy efficiency. When you look at the Nordics, we are actually uh, front runners here. We have set more ambition at uh, climate targets. Most of the countries have it with, before the EU have it already. They have very large uh, uh, reduction in, in their uh, targets. And also, if you look at the electricity market, where the EU has a 50% uh, renewables in, in 2030, in 2030, most of the electricity in the Nordics is renewable. It's only Sweden that is, is, is a little bit uh, behind, but, but it's, it's just because they, 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 they need a little more time to, to find out what to do with the, the nuclear. So we are very in, in long uh, out there. And you can also see it if you look at the statistics, if you look at who is on track with the EU 2020 climate uh, target of, of this renewable energy share of, of the total uh, energy consumption, you see that that EU as total is not on track, it's still missing. But the Nordic countries, they reached their targets two years in, in, in advance. So they're two, two years ahead of schedule and they have a very high share of, of renewable energy already. So we have a good starting point. When you look at which kind of, of technologies is, is actually being deployed, as you probably know, we have a lot of hydropower, uh, but the new technologies that is, uh, are deployed is mostly wind energy, a little bit of solar and geothermal. So we have a, a huge expansion of wind power and we have done that for many years. So we have a lot of experience within uh, wind power, both onshore and offshore. So uh, when you look at, at the total targets of getting more climate neutral, uh, then it's not only about electricity, but you also have to look at, at the other sectors. If you look at the, and now just two some numbers from the EU in total, but you see that electricity is only around one fifth of total energy consumption and heating and cooling are at 50 and then transport is, is uh, one third around that. Uh, heating and cooling is actually uh, larger in, in the Nordic country. But anyway, it's numbers pretty soon then. So what you have to, to, to say is that when you have the electricity, which is almost decarbonized by now, or will be it within one or two years, three years, then the electricity sector can work as a catalysator for the decarbonizing the other sectors. So, so this is also what, what you actually would like to do. Um, you would like to have electrification sector coupling, as you just heard uh, Professor Kim just spoke about before. And you have to be aware that you cannot solve the problem by just having sector coupling when you have a lot of viable renewables on the supply side. You need to have a smart energy system, smart sector coupling. That's important. On the transport side, you also need to, 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 to do that in a smart way. Um, of course, direct, direct electrification, but also hydrogen and power trace is, is very tight uh, right now. And then finally, you can have carbon capture. So these are the three issues that I would like to, to look a little bit more on and, and suggest for, for further cooperation. When you look at the smart energy system, we just heard about the Korean, uh, everybody knows that they are very uh, advanced in smart energy system, but also the Nordics have very strong positions on, on smart energy system. 
there's this uh, former CEO of Nokia, another uh, mobility, uh, mobile phone company in the Nordics from Finland. He has made this uh, report uh, with a Nordic target of, of being the smartest energy system in the world. This is area where we have common um, common uh, targets with the South Korea and could be very uh, useful to work closer together. There's already good collaboration uh, in this area already. One of the new areas is, is the power tricks and also the green hydrogen for maritime transport. As you probably know, hydrogen is, is, is uh, high on the agenda in, in many countries. Um, but what, what is very specific with the Nordic countries and also with South Korea is that the maritime sector is, is quite large. So this is, could be a very good area to collaborate. South Korea is, is, is leading in many respects with the hydrogen vehicles and the Nordics are leading with many respects uh, with, with, it, with respect to renewable energy integration and, and power to X. So together they could actually come out and say, okay, how do we make a green maritime transport? Not only based it on, on, on gray or, or blue hydrogen, but also actually make it uh, green hydrogen. And I think that is uh, important. We have launched a, a research pro program. This is up in the left corner, this Nordic Maritime Transport Energy Research Program. Just one year ago, and actually the, the um, from the application, we can see there's a lot of interest in, in doing more research uh, collaboration within uh, this area. And I know that South Korea is also uh, coming up with, for example, this uh, uh, 2030 uh, green ship promotion actually is, 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 is shifting around to, to green uh, fuels. So this could be a, a nice place to collaborate, I think. A third one uh, could be with respect to carbon capture, both for utilization, but also for storage. It could be for, for, for just uh, going from, from gray uh, to, to blue to, to, to in the future, uh, green hydrogen, but it could also be for other uh, utilization where you need uh, the carbon sources for, for other uh, fuels, for example, or for, for example, for the, for the aviation uh, fuels and so on. So this could also be a nice one. So these were the three uh, subjects. I would just raise them for, for open up for the discussion in the panel. Um, and of course, I think that's that's all for me. So now I'm open for questions, anything. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very thank you very much. Uh, indeed, that well, was the, uh, that actually uh, raised a number of, of issues. Well, that uh, will be discussed in in the discussion session. Okay, uh, now I will ask. Uh, Professor Lin for presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, let me express my deep gratitude to Korea University and then um, does Nordic countries, a wonderful dialogue. I'm, I'm more than happy uh, to join this dialogue today. Uh, I'm not an IT person at all and I don't have any engineering backgrounds. Um, instead, um, I have been more focusing on Korea, Japan, Japan and Korea's energy policies, uh, more specifically speaking, nuclear. So that is why I had several chances to visit um, nuclear related sites uh, in, uh, in the Sweden, for example, or in the Switzerland as well. So based on that kind of my research backgrounds, um, these days I'm trying to more focus on the fourth re industrial revolution related stuff or uh, carbon neutrality. So my uh, presentation, uh, what I prepared uh, was uh, pretty much overlapped with the uh, Dean Kim. So I'm trying to um, escaping or skip uh, the, the parts uh, that are overlapped with the uh, Dean um, Kim. And then I'm gonna focus more on the uh, kind of, you know, policy suggestion related parts. So let me uh, share my slides. Hold on a second. Okay. Oh, this is my little courtesy. Um, I just brought my little memories from my pri private uh, private trip to Stockholm and also other other Nordic uh, city. So as we all know, you know, Korea is one of the largest um, contributor in terms of the. Uh, uh, 
carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, as a single country, um, it has ranked as one of the top 10, and its share is approximately um, is less than the 22 Percent. I'm sorry, two percent. Uh, of course, situations getting better. Um, again, as you can see from this kind of in the chart, annual percentage change in the um, CO2 emission it goes down. Um, but if you see this kind of um, data, which is little, um, how would you describe it? As, as more challenging um, because our per capita CO2 emission is pretty high, 11.93, compared to, for example, our neighbor, again, Japan, for example, 8.72. China is another story, but China, again, 7.1. US, Canada, obviously, they are their efficiency, they're more like a US is their culture is pretty different. So their number is pretty different uh, from Asian countries. But anyhow, even compared to the US, um, Canada like country, you know, South Korea's this number is pretty big, which indicates that again, our probably efficiency, um, energy consumption efficiency level might not be that great. And is again, industrial structure, uh, which contributes to this kind of, you know, again, the high number. And NDC, our NDC has been updated, as many of you already know. Um, our original NDC at the Paris um, Agreement was only like 37% from BAU. This is the most controversial part. So which was, again, to criticize a lot internationally and domestically. And last year, of course, as we all know, President Moon Jae-in pledged to reach the carbon neutrality by 2050. But as a, as a kind of interim goal, again, South Korean government updated the NDC last December, and now it's 24.4 by again to 2030. Of course, criticism <laughs> still continue. Uh, Mr. Al Gore, who is a worldwidely known advocate um, of the uh, all this, you know, response or fight against the uh, climate crisis he called. Um, he, he sent out a letter to uh, President Moon Jae-in last year. And this year, again, only just one ago, um, he also just said um, that covers this NDC issue. And um, Mr. Ergo, he criticized this. Again, this is not enough. Um, so still the criticism continue. But as I mentioned earlier, again, the, if you think about our industrial structure, um, again, this number can be challenging as uh, Dean um, Kim Won-jun already briefly mentioned. Um, again, this is my pie, uh, our pie, the pie chart uh, that, that shows um, Korea's primary energy consumption, as we all know, which this society is pretty much dependent on the fossil fuel. Again, more than like uh, 80 is from fossil fuel. But if you think about, again, the structure, um, this is the a chart that shows you um, the, the major exporting products of South Korea. And as you see, it's still metal related or uh, petroleum related. Uh, stuff products are pretty big. Um, again, considering the fact that Korea's GDP, uh, the composition of Korea's GDP, uh, almost 40% of Korea's GDP is from our, our export, and um, between 10 and 20% of our export is related to this again the fossil fuel or fossil fuel things. So that is why um, I would like to highlight more um, on the, uh, um, the possibility or the, the demands um, for diversification, uh, diversifying um, secondary energy, um, which is for this case, again, the electricity. Um, this is our, again, the power generation by source, um, which is pretty much still, um, I'm sorry to say like this way, but embarrassing. Um, coal is not that green, but I don't know why my government colored again to coal with the green. And anyhow, the core part is the biggest part, as you see. See and uh, uh, gas, of course, uh, which is another like great portion, and nuclear, of course, uh, still it is uh, providing the base load, but new renewable. Um, again, as you see from this. 
this bar chart, which is pretty small yet. So that is why, again, the international, again, reputation evaluation is not that great. Again, for example, um, World Economic Forum's, their um, energy transition uh, index, um, according to their um, ETI research last year, again, I'm envious all these Nordic countries are, um, as the Mr. Skite already mentioned, they are all front runners. Um, while my country is here, um, next to again, even Mexico, Argentina, Ecuador, um, again, which should be fixed. Um, but our economy uh, grows rate. If you think about the, the growth rate, it slows down. I don't want to say we get we we entered already entered into a recession um, stage, but somewhat kind of again the, we our economic growth um, is slowing down certainly. Um, but if you see this kind of again another uh, another um, how would you say climate change related um, grading score again our performance is not that great. So having said that, that is why Korean government, of course, recognized the problems as well. That is why uh, this government is trying to combine all this problem together and to get through, um, to break through again, the, all this difficulty. Our plan is more like a comprehensive. Again, um, Korea's New Deal is composed of mainly three parts. Again, the digital New Deal, Green New Deal, and then uh, social safety network. Uh, it does have um, 10 major subjects. Uh, under each category. So I don't probably have really enough time to explain all this detail. But the, the point is, again, the Korean government is trying to make some kind of synergetic effects between the different category. Again, the digital New Deal, Green New Deal, and the social safety network too. Uh, considering our um, aging population or depopulation of um, rural size and so on. Um, so this is again about the Green New Deal, again, that they are trying to make this as an opportunity um, to, uh, to reboost again the Korea's economic growth and this the New Deal, same story, um, they are trying to take this as an opportunity. Um, the problem is, again, as a person who is studying, researching on um, comparative politics or governance, again, we have still many uh, challenges. Um, for example, again, as Dean Kimonjun already mentioned, um, the infrastructure reform is really um, necessary and inevitable. But if you think about the market structure, again, the CAPCO is still kind of kind of, it's not clearly monopoly because in the generation sector, uh, the market is already open. Uh, but still, if you think about the distribution issue, the greed situation, um, again, the Hanguk the, Chalyok, the, 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 those, you know, public corporation is de facto the monopoly. Um, so considering this kind of, again, the market very rigid, um, vertically integrated uh, market structure is not that easy, but I'm not saying that market liberalization is really the, the solution. So I would love to definitely learn from the Nordic countries experience. Um, and the nuclear phase out, coal phase out, these two are actually, I think, this is my own personal just observation, but these two are actually conflicting. Um, mostly because of the political reasons. So I would like to actually suggest more strategic approaches necessary, but for some reasons, again, I, I'm running out of my time. So I, I'd love to move on to further the follow-up uh, discussion. So if I have a chance, I can probably talk about this more, but anyhow, these two are conflicting now. So definitely I'd love to learn from the uh, uh, Nordic countries case. And finally, um, Korea should, again, this is my just a suggestion, not only just intergovernmental level, um, as other panelists already mentioned, uh, business to business, um, enterprise versus enterprise level, um, partnership or collaboration, if possible, they're kind of more like a, a private sector collaboration um, is also very much, I think, um, desirable. And how to institutionalize those, you know, kind of partnership is um, another like a probably a question for us. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for um, attention. Again, this is Copenhagen picture. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Lim. Uh, 
Well, actually, uh, once again, once again, thank you for all for presenters and sorry for pushing your back to a sprinter track. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it it is the yeah, yeah it, it is. I know it is it is quite sinful uh, to ask, ask the, the the expert to to limit their remarking in, in ten minutes, but uh, but uh, I guess the, we we have been very energy efficient in uh, delivering the key messages. We, we, so uh, continuing on on that smart grid system. So we will continue. Uh, we will move to the discussion round. Okay, and. Uh, and the audience, and the audience, uh, we, we, we have a uh, good number of the discussant, the regular panelists, but also we ha have a number of the other participants. So if they want to, if anyone wants to leave uh, the question, then, then uh, feel free to use the chat board and please identify yourself. Okay. And, uh, First of all, I uh, using the privilege of, of moderators. I will. I would like to ask one simple question per each. Uh, first, uh, to to Mr. Hector, and, and you mentioned about the open innovation, and the term open will carries quite a lot of meanings, and uh, the traditionally European model, especially the the, uh, the, the northern European social model. An economic model was, was based on on the stakeholder, the uh, stakeholdership, not just the shareholdership. And but nowadays, well, innovation, it, it especially IT innovation, it is is a rear kind of the it is the, the rear spearhead of industrial competitiveness. So the any discovery and any ownership of a particular technology. Uh, can guarantee a lot of revenue, investment, and, and profit. And uh, as long as the private companies are ha have have the ownership of that core technology or state of the art technology, uh, sometimes it, it it is quite difficult for the government or the, or the public sector to push private sector to say broaden the stakeholdership or kind of the sharing uh, the benefit or sharing the technology. So how to, how to bring the private sector in this uh, ideal mutually win-win track in, and how this PPP public partnership or kind of global partnership considering uh, well, proper international development can be linked this to this kind of open innovation system. So that will be uh, my first question to Mr. Hacker. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. That's a pertinent question. Not very easy to, to but let, let me take a crack at it. Um, I see that there is a double, there are two, very different kinds of uh, ICT related uh, innovations or, or domains of innovation. One is uh, that is uh, heavily um, system oriented, like uh, I telecom systems and you know the 5Gs and the 4Gs and the 6Gs and uh, uh, the, the smart factories uh, that are connected to those and, and so on. And the other is uh, the technologies that are making use for the actors and innovators that are making use of these platforms. So um, in, I would say the private sector is uh, already today very good at driving this open innovation. And, and it may even be that uh, uh, if, if it wasn't for the industry led open competition in the telecom sector to stay with that just a minute uh, we, we wouldn't be where we are today because governments and, and singular companies couldn't do it themselves and gov governments couldn't do it themselves either but competitors that really don't like each other coming together sitting around the table uh, bringing their technologies to the table and and 
having a frank discussion about which technology is the best, which uh, patents uh, should can we agree on, how can we share this uh, cake to create a market that, that we then can compete on is uh, something fantastic. That's, uh, I, I would say that's the biggest thing that comes uh, out of the liberalization of the 1990s. Um, it, it's huge and it's very innovative. And it's uh, truly spearheading uh, innovation and, and it's private sector led. Um, governments, uh, of course, need to be regulating this uh, in, a, in an active way. And they have been st struggling, but keeping up anyway. I know that there is a lot of uh, uh, stress about governments not doing enough or not regulating enough, or that there is a lot of pains taking place with the growth of the mobile markets and the, and the internet market. But I want to compare with the, the growth of radio, uh, regular analog radio that started in the 1920s. There's this beautiful PhD thesis uh, studying how radio upended uh, the news industry in the United States. The title is War on Media. And when you read this uh, uh, PhD that was written in the 1980s about radio in the 20s and the 30s, it could easily be understood to be about the internet. It's exactly the same actors. It's exactly the same problems. It gave rise to political movements in the 30s that are very questionable. There are so many uh, uh, similarities that are taking place again. So I'm not really, I'm, I'm concerned of course by, by how this is developing, but I'm not very concerned because I also realized that we need to learn from history. And one of the things we learn from history is that things take time. Uh, we need to go through the motions to, to learn, to find the ways of, of moving forward. And the issues that I mentioned about coming together, meeting your, your uh, um, not opponents, but uh, your partners in, in, uh, in a respectful uh, way, um, respecting each other's legitimate claims. Industry need to respect that there are legitimate public needs and the public sector need to respect that there are legitimate commercial needs. I mean, it sounds obvious, but it really isn't obvious because in some countries, South American countries, many of them, uh, the governments really consider uh, companies as enemies, uh, which is absurd if you want to you know, build an economy and so on. I'm sorry, that's uh, maybe uh, taking the question a little bit uh, away, but um, I, I do believe that uh, it's a stakeholdership. It's uh, very much uh, all, everybody comes uh, to the table and bring with them uh, what they have and, and respect the others' uh, uh, legitimate claims uh, as well. Maybe that's some kind of an answer to your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. All right, okay. Uh, and, and next, I well, I, and I appreciate the, the, the great explanation on, on the resilience growth. And, and, and yes, well, last year, I had a great pleasure to work with the, the KAIST team led by Adi and Kim on, on the, this resilience growth and, and, and new energy paradigm. And uh, so, well, certainly, was I and I, I was certainly I I was also a big fan of the resilience in in the future energy system, but uh, but as, as a as an well as a person looking at, at geopolitics and and also energy security uh, agenda, uh, sometimes I'm I'm thinking I'm well at, at night usually uh, like two animals may appear and and that keep me uh, awake at night. And, and those two animals uh, are first black swan, unexpected, unexpected thing may happen. And that will, uh, and, and kind of all, all the resilience system, well, the, the, the threat and, and shock may override, well the, 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 well, the planned resilience. And the second animal is gray rhino. So it, it, it is a present danger, it is approaching. We know it, but sometimes we, we, we are watching it, but sometimes we, uh, we don't know when is, is the final, optimal, and last minute 
to avoid that threat. So uh, what could be, what could be in, in this resilience uh, growth paradigm? What would be, what could be the, the black swan or unexpected uh, kind of crisis? And what would be the clear and present danger approaching? And, and we do uh, need to uh, plan a, a good escape. You're being uh, muted, sure. Yes, so the pleasure is mine that uh, we can work together with, uh, with you, with Lee. And it was, uh, uh, yeah, we, yeah, uh, it was very great, insightful uh, kind of forum together. Mm, uh, how we define as black tide includes black swan, black elephant, uh, and other kind of uh, risk we are facing uh, because uh, like Black Swan came up with uh, more of a financial uh, kind of crisis uh, in uh, like two decades ago. Uh, it's what like one time, uh, one aspect, one dimension shock to the global uh, society. And what I emphasize is that uh, uh, these uh, swans are kind of coming together with uh, herds with like tens of swans, black swans, or tens of uh, like elephants. Uh, so that I think the one of the most challenging part, like I, I think the, the previous uh, session was also related with that aspect is about, I think it's a, uh, sometimes well, someone call it a deglobalization, and I call it as a globalization 2.0, that uh, global society, like uh, the clouds emphasized that the global value chain is very tight. And these segregations or restructuring of the value chain definitely will be inefficient and also impact many of the companies. Uh, I think everybody knows that the global value chain minimizes the cost of uh, productions and services. But on the other hand, uh, these big challenges of uh, like China, uh, especially China, and, and some of uh, the, like the other countries are kind of creating a lot of uh, disharmony across different regions. And these kind of risk uh, actually create a lot of noises uh, in the global uh, regions, not only like in this the peninsula and also in South Asia and Taiwan uh, and also uh, in, the, in the middle uh, Mediterranean regions. And so uh, it's kind of uh, creating a lot of, uh, how do I say, the noise of risk uh, in many dimensions. So I think the first part of the most biggest challenge might be the, the global uh, restructuring uh, that's coming in. And then next, second, definitely the uh, climate change and global warming uh, might be the second uh, black swan or black elephant. Black swan might be. Uh, and black tide uh, in, in that perspective. And uh, while this black uh, climate change, it seems like more of a, uh, uh, how do I say that, it's really with the, even for the pandemic and virus, but also it creates social problems between uh, the, how do I say, the so social segregations, uh, like uh, poor people have uh, less social security uh, protections, uh, and also uh, there's a like social problem happens. So I think the climate change and the deglobalization, so globalization 2.0 have uh, creating a lot of different uh, kind of black swans in coming period of time. I think it's a little bit just too long, but yeah. So I, I hope my answer was, was, uh, was enough. <laughs> Professor Lee, you are muted. Oh, that was fair enough. And uh, the next question uh, will go to Mr. Sket. Uh, you, you, well, actually, the Korea ha have some uh, precious partnership with Nordic countries in, in this green energy sector. For example, Korea Danish, uh, the green partnership was, was already, it was already decade long uh, the partnership. And 
And I, I do hope, I do hope that the Nordic countries uh, and, and, and Korea could, could accelerate, expand and accelerate those you know, the green energy partnership. And uh, you have mentioned one, one a very important uh, energy resource, which is hydrogen. And Korea is nowadays interested in, in, in a number of renewable energies, but actually uh, one of key focus has, has been given to hydrogen. And, and of course, we, we, we have blue hydrogen, the green hydrogen, and from, from, from blue to green, uh, the, the transition is going on. But how do you foresee the uh, well, other than kind of long distance uh, transportation world, how, how do you foresee, especially in, in the European scheme, uh, that the hydrogen will, will play a role in, in this new energy system? Well, that's a good question. I think hydrogen would play a role in, in, in many industries where it's, it's hard to do direct electrification. Uh, since our most uh, used energy resource uh, as renewable energy sources is, is generated through electricity from wind and, and solar and hydro, um, hydro, then direct electrification is, is the most cost-effective way to do it. But then hydrogen can be used in, as we, you, you just mentioned, long distance uh, transport. It could also be used in as an energy storage. Uh, you can use it for that. Or you could use it in, in industries, like in, in steel, uh, where you need a high temperature, uh, where it's hard to, to do with direct electrification and other things. So, so, so hydrogen in that case will, will be kind of an energy carrier, in my perspective, uh, which would facilitate a fast green transition. But I just think that transport is so obvious to start with, uh, because it's, it's, it's hard to, 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 to find other solution when you have long, long distance uh, transportation. I don't know if it answered it enough. And then again, the challenge is, is, is because in, in Korea, you are very advanced in, in hydrogen, but the challenge is to make green. So it's also sustainable. I think that that's where we can can work together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yes. We 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 know we know the the, the util well, the hydrogen the, the green hydrogen will be the the, the ultimate uh, destination. But uh, building the market, building the infrastructure, and uh, and also we have to take care of the well, have to consider the, the cost element cost and, and quantity element. So we will see, we will see uh, how these two regions are, are moving toward much, much greener, well, even, even in the hydrogen part of the world, how, how this country will move to the greener side. Okay, and, and, and lastly, uh, to ask him, uh, well, you, well, you have mentioned the double dip, or the like double kind of challenge from low the, the uh, nuclear phasing out and coal phasing out. Okay, and and that will certainly be the, the big challenge for for Korea in energy transition. Okay, and as as a specialist in, in, in nuclear energy uh, sector, well, how do you how do you assess uh, the future role of nuclear in this energy transition? Period. Because if we put more emphasis on the climate change side, low carbon side, but well, certainly there will be a larger room for nuclear. And if we put the focus more on the green side and more environmental side, then well, somehow the, the nuclear is uh, is not uh, being welcomed by environmentalists. So, what is your perspective? Again, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, for giving me some chances to talk about a more political side of this nuclear phase out versus core phase out. The other day, I did have a chance to have a dialogue conversation with the advisory group who are advising again to this government and then who are more focusing on the climate change issues. But what I was pretty surprised by was, you know, they are trying to, or they, they're interpreting, okay, they're, they're interpreting, again, the nuclear and the renewable cannot be compatible at the same time. Again, this is more like 
this government supporting advisory group's view, which is, again, judgment is pretty much depends on your own observations, but my analysis, my evaluation is a little different. So what I suggested for them was, you know, as I wrote in my last slide, again, we need to think about the optimal balance or mixture between BERC and distributed, considering the existing power grid, but Burke is not even the synonym of nuclear, right? Burke does have gas, coal, many other stuff. So my point is, again, um, these days in Korea, um, pretty good number of people are just interpreting, again, nuclear um, as a kind of, again, incompatible energy with the uh, renewable. Um, and for some reasons, which might be correct, Again, if you're considering, if you consider the the, the how just the limitation of power greed, but um, again, as Professor Lee already mentioned, if you think about the the more like a positive sides of the nuclear in terms of emission, well, I uh, personally do think we need to be more strategic. This coal definitely should be prioritized. Then coal phase out again uh, should be prioritized more than nuclear phase out, I think. But again, um, these days in Korea, um, this kind of again, uh, remark can be pretty much controversial or even to even be offensive to some people. So, well, we'll see. Uh, but international reputation about the nuclear has been changing a lot. Um, of course, Fukushima aftermath, think about um, Well, I definitely understand the criticism. And then um, pretty good number of people are still very much critical about the nuclear. Um, but again, um, if you think about uh, the, the positive side of the nuclear in terms of um, emission, Again, my suggestion is we need to be more like strategic. We, when we think about the mixture for the short term, for the midterm, or for the longer term. So, well, I, my answer might be pretty vague, um, but I hope uh, we can be uh, more less less political, uh, less politicized by you know viewing some specific sources. I, I'm sorry, my answer might be pretty vague to your that question. Well, mm -hmm. Actually, so far the. the, the the answer in response from from G seven G twenty has been, what especially G seven been, been well energy well the nuclear energy it, it may may not be in one one single straight jacket, so each country may have have a different one. Well, may may not pushing well like the boosting it, but uh, somehow it, it will be uh, it will also be a challenge to to find one one single one single model modality in, in managing the future nuclear part. So what well, that would be one, one of our the, the ta one of the tasks of, of our generation. Okay, uh, I have one question uh, from the floor actually from from uh, from from insider. So the, uh, the Matt Engman uh, raised the question and it raised as the distinction between military and civilian use, and technology in general is, is becoming more blurred. Are there opportunities or even necessity to include business more in security dialogue? And how can we achieve this? Well, as far as my under, under, understanding goes, well, on, on, well, a number of technology or even business breakthrough actually came from the development of, of military technology. And, and nowadays, I'm not sure which sector is, is moving faster from military or, or from military to business or business to military. But uh, how, how well, it, anyone will, will respond to, to this, uh, the military business uh, relation in, in technology innovation? Let, let me uh, leave a, a quick comment that- uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so now is this uh, changing global paradigm of, uh, I call it like a globalization 2.0 or deglobalizations makes us to think about the industry as a more security perspective, national security perspective. So um, uh, more and more like now with the semiconductor, the US actually tried to secure as a strategic industry. So I think uh, more and more 
uh, kind of accepting private sector uh, as uh, kind of as one of a strategic security component, uh, I, I think it's coming in uh, more and more. So uh, now uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, discussing about industry policy. We, we've been kind of, uh, it's a very old history of discussing industry policy before, but now the paradigm is shifting to the A era where we can discuss further about industry, the private company as a strategic uh, resources for the nations. So I think, uh, uh, it naturally, more and more nations uh, will try to include private company as a national security uh, aspect. But uh, yeah, that's my just short comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, I sure. I would agree, and uh, it's uh, very clear that uh, industry is both uh, the guarantee of uh, security. I mean, they're very much creating security. Um, and they're also very much the victims for when security is breaking down. So it's very clear to me that it's a multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. situation where there need to be uh, a, tr a trusting uh, conversation mm -hmm. going on, which of course is, is very sensitive and, and uh, difficult, but um, it's, it's very important that it is. And I actually have quite good faith uh, that is, this is also working quite well. Well, I mean, there are security issues with security, but I think the process is working fairly well because it's uh, such, a, such a real politics uh, area where, where the government is interested in securing, uh, um, enabling companies to operate and, and maybe even uh, vice versa. So not the stakeholder. Thank you very much. I guess that, that will be uh, the fair enough for uh, for this time. All right. So now uh, we are heading toward the the, the noon time, the twelve p.m. in in Sweden and seven p.m. in Seoul. That means uh, well, I'm I'm. Uh, this is time to wrap up. Uh, this this the energy well and IT and, and energy session I I indeed well want to have have some follow up sessions, uh, but but I, I work well I expect well our further discussion uh, could be continued in in this Nordic Korea uh, dialogue setting and and well Ambassador the uh, Hargren. And, and also Nicholas did mention that, well, hopefully, well, the Seoul will be able to host the next, when, when the COVID is over, then we can travel each other. And even we, with the green transportation, we, we can travel each other and, uh, and discuss, well, the, this, well, the, the energy and IT innovations are, are a big task that uh, we need to cover and we need to handle in the future. So, well, once again, I'm, I appreciate uh, excellent presentations and discussion from the prominent panelists. Uh, thank you very much. And I will uh, wrap up the second session and turn the floor uh, to Sang Su. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you thank very you. much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee and uh, all. Uh, this is my great pleasure to make uh, this closing remark. Uh, today, actually, we had a long, long discussion for three hours, and it was really, really comprehensive discussion about the many issues uh, of uh, common challenges and cooperation between Nordic region and South Korea. And that the areas we discussed today were very broad, from uh, security to IT and uh, renewable energies. Although we put the security and uh, technology issues in the two separate uh, uh, sessions, uh, still I'm thinking uh, two issues today equally influenced by uh, the current uh, recent increase of US-China uh, rivalry because IT and the renewable energy sector even uh, are a part of US-Chinese competition. 
in that regard, I think uh, there are competitions in these areas, uh, technology and renewable energy sector will become more and more serious. Uh, because uh, it sounds, it's, uh, I'm not very pessimistic person, but uh, there is some more area for competition, but less areas for cooperation in the world in the, in the future. However, uh, I think this new geopolitical situation, ironically, uh, will provide more room for cooperation between Nordic and uh, South Korea, I believe. As many already mentioned, uh, Nordic and South Korea are sharing common values of democracy, human rights, and a law of the law. Also, the, the, the two regions are world's most innovative and technology advanced countries. So I think two regions uh while they are keeping their common values but um, there is some more room for cooperation on not only on security and uh, but also on the uh, sector of technologies uh this is uh, uh our future uh, potential uh, more and more we can see it. that's why we need to continue this Nordic Korea dialogue and I hope our dialogue will become uh, most important platform uh, for academic uh, expert business and policymakers from Nordic countries and South Korea. I would like to really thank all of you uh, and one, uh, two things I wanted to mention before I'm, I'm closing this remark. One is thank you for uh, the Korean side, especially because <laughs> your participation is really, really until late. I know it's already in the evening time. And then the second thing, actually, on the, uh, the Swedish side, we learned uh, from you uh, when it comes to gender balance this time. Next time, we will try to invite more female speakers in our next Nordic Korea dialogue. Thank you again. Uh, I hope to see you uh, in our next Nordic Korea dialogue. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much, Sangs, for all your, your endeavor to organize this meeting. So big Thank big you. cheers for 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 Sangsu too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.